The latter is stability of towers is either governed by wind or earthquake. And the taller you go, the more likelihood that your tower will be governed by wind. Fortunately for wind design, there are some methods that we can put into place to help mitigate the forces of wind. And these are seen in some of the iconic structures we see around the world, such as Park Avenue that overlooks the Central Park in New York, or Taipei 101 in Taipei, Taiwan. A tower is over the skyline and its unique shape is iconic and I'm sure everyone's realised whenever they've seen it. Or the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, towering at almost 900 metres over the Dubai surface. I'll be going through some of these mitigation methods and how they can be effective to help reduce them to make your towers more effective. My name is Brendan, a structural engineer based in Australia and I produce videos around structural engineering. So if you do like that type of topic, please subscribe. Now let's get into it. Let's go through some basics. So what are stability systems and how can we address them? Well, stability systems change depending on the height of your structure. When you're starting at the lower height, we have more frames. Then we move into shear walls. Then we can move into cores, cores without riggers, tube and tube, die grids, buttress trusses, and so on and so on. Each allowing us to construct further and further. Each of them had their unique properties and design characteristics. And depending on the height you're going, will generally dictate what type of system you're going to adopt. Also, sometimes you're required by architecture to adopt one method over the other. Now that we've gone through basics of the stability systems that can be adopted, it's really fundamental that you understand what wind is. And wind is really what affects most of our structures. It can be more complex than you thought. So wind can either be a drag force on the front face as the structure gets pushed along. You also have a suction force at the back as the wind blows past it. You can also have downdraft or suction up depending on which way the forces are going. There's many directions that wind can pull your structure. And also as the wind flows past the structure, it creates eddies behind the structure that can cause the structure to oscillate back and forth, which I'm sure you've seen in events when you're seeing a big pole rock backwards and forwards. It's generally going perpendicular to the direction of wind. And this is due to the eddies forming behind it. As we can see in this figure, you can see the air flowing past the rectangular structure, causing eddies in behind it to swirl that makes the building rock backwards and forwards. This vortex shedding is often what governs the design of many structures, more so than the lateral heat of structures. When you build structures around each other, these eddies can cause damaging effects onto the adjacent building. So just because you have buildings beside you or adjacent you, doesn't necessarily make your designs better or easier. Another thing you realize is the higher you go, the higher the wind speed. And this has to do with a common known factor known as Reynolds number. So what is Reynolds number? Reynolds number is essentially the friction force that a flow of liquid or air feels when it's driving, driving across a rough surface. So essentially what happens is you have a column of air flowing along the surface. It has a rough surface, so then it slows further and further down. Then as the next surface lies on top of each other, essentially in infinite layers, they provide additional friction forces to the forces above and below it. So the higher you go up, obviously the less these friction forces are, so the higher your wind speeds get. As wind speeds increase, as the height of our tower goes up, this has a double effect. As any tower is essentially a cantilever from ground floor, the higher you go up, the more effect you'll have on your tower. And the higher you go up, the wind speeds increase, so the forces on your tower are also increased. So it's important that we know the way to try and mitigate these forces and help make sure that our structures stand up effectively and efficiently. Wind design is also so complex that even some of the best supercomputers are unable to calculate the effects that wind has. So to address this, scale models are built out and put into wind tunnels to test the structural mechanics of fluid behavior. This is how we address some of the tallest buildings where we model the structural behavior behind the structure and even sometimes model the stiffnesses as well so that we can get the forces out that we will see our structure in the real world. Let's move on to Park Avenue in New York and what methods they have put into place to mitigate the forces of wind. A little bit about Park Avenue itself. It towers at over 426 meters overlooking Central Park and has a slender distance ratio of one to 15. To put that into some kind of context, a slender tower is anything from above one to 10. At one to 15, this is 50% more than that ratio, making it almost super skinny. It looks like a pencil, as we can see here, it looks too skinny to be real. 
So Park Avenue's stability system is tube in tube. It essentially has an inner core and an outer core to form as a whole structure. So essentially the whole building is forming the lateral stability system. And during early wind tunnel testing, they soon found out that this tower was highly subjective to this vortex shedding force that we saw before. So the tower would rock backwards and forwards under the effects of wind, which would make it impossible to design. So putting their heads together, they were able to come up with ways of shaping the tower to stop this vortex shedding from occurring. And what they did was essentially make the plant floors completely hollow to allow air to pass through them. And they're there to put the mechanical services in, so the things like air, water, and anything else that you need to operate the tower over or under. And by opening it up air, and allowing air to flow through, they're able to break up these vortexes and significantly reduce the effects of this vortex shedding, thus effectively physically reducing the force that is occurring on our tower due to the wind effects. Another thing that they did as well, this tower was very slender, so it had an acceleration problem which is not acceptable for this type of structure. To address this, they put in some tuned mass dampeners. So what are tuned mass dampeners? Well, they come into two methods. You can either have a passive or an active tuned mass damper. And what they do is effectively dampen out a frequency to stop the building from oscillating at that natural frequency. All builders have a natural frequency that it causes it to excite more and more. And this is normally the velocity that they want to behave at. This is most evident in the example of the glass being a subject to a loud sound. As we can see here, as the sound is increased on this glass, it oscillates further and further to the point where it breaks. A tune mass dampener effectively counterbalances this action and sort of balances out, stopping the building to be able to vibrate at its natural frequency. And there's really two ways you can either do this. You can either have active dampening or passive damping. Now, passive damping is generally preferred as there's really low maintenance and it will work whether you have electricity or not. These generally form in forms of giant pendulums or water tanks as well. So essentially, as the structure moves, the pendulum or the water sways to one side, balancing out that movement. And as they are passive, there's really minimal maintenance methods required. There is a second one, and it's more effective than the passive one, and that is active. And this generally needs activators and pushers and pulleys to change the frequency. It's essentially the same thing as the passive, allowing you to balance out and counterbalance balance the force, but it has additional actuators in it to allow you to control the frequency that it can balance. So it can vibrate at different frequencies, counterbalancing a range of frequencies throughout the structure. Park Avenue actually has two of these tune mass dampers weighing at over 1,200 tons, and are made up of cables and actuators and essentially acting as giant pendulums to counterbalance the forces of the wind. Now let's move on to Taipei 101. This is a tower in Taiwan, carrying it over 510 meters. It's made up of a central core with outriggers. And similar to Park Avenue, during early testing, it was found to be highly excitable from these vortex shedding events. So, they approached this in a different way to what they did in New York. However, they did shape the tower to prevent these vortex shedding. So essentially, by shaving off the corners and creating the sawtooth shape, it disrupts the wind and prevents it from forming those vortexes behind the tower, effectively reducing the wind load on our structure. So although they've approached it a different way to Park Avenue, they've effectively shaped the tower to help prevent the formation of these vortexes behind the tower that would be highly destructive. Taipei 101 also has one of the most famous tuned mass dampers. I'm sure you've seen images of this. It actually became a tourist attraction. Essentially, it's a giant ball in the heart of the tower that sways backwards and forwards. It also has a series of actuators on the bottom of it as well. So they're able to activate them to make it more of an active system when needed. They tune out a number of different frequencies depending on how the structure is behaving. So this tower has come up with two methods to help reduce the wind loads similar to Park Avenue. They have approached it in different ways. Now, let's move on to the Burj Khalifa. The monster super tall in Dubai, towering it at almost 900 meters over Dubai, paling all the other skyscrapers around it into insignificance. The stability system of the Burj Khalifa is a buttress system. As you can see, the central core is an octagon shape. 
has a series of buttress arms around the outside, forming a Y shape. Now these buttress arms are widest at the base and they taper in as the tail goes up, essentially allowing you to have a really wide stability system at the base. It also makes it really stiff. So similar to a buttress on a trorch, as it leans in, as it goes up, the, but the stability system moves further and further in, as it doesn't need as much lever arm to stabilize the structure, allowing them to have a really stiff, solid structure. Also, similar to these other towers, there was a vortex shedding problem with this tower as well. However, they were able to shape the tower in such a way by causing bumps across the structure, similar to the bumps that you'd see on a golf ball. In addition to this, they effectively curved the corners and randomly stepped the tower in as it went up. This effectively confused the wind and eliminated the vortex shedding on this structure, thus effectively allowing the tower to cut through the wind and not have these destructive vortexes form behind it. And also because the tower was so stiff due to the buttress system adopted on this tower, it didn't require any tuned mass damper as it was stiff enough in its own right to resist the impact forces of wind. The design of tall towers is highly complex and the mitigation of the wind is critical to any super tall design. As these forces would be too large, requiring these stability systems to be oversized and preventing them from being viable in the real world. So when we are designing our tall towers, it's not just the structural elements we need to think about, but there are any other mitigation methods that we can put into place, such as shaping. I'd actually recommend when you are designing these super tall towers, is trying to do a shaping study with the wind consultant to come up with the most efficient shape possible. Wind design is highly complex, so it's really hard to understand inside a computer model. You generally have to build these models and put them into wind tunnels to test your design assumptions to ensure they're correct. And if you have made it to this point, you obviously enjoyed the video. So don't forget to smash the like button so this can be brought out to more people. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you do want to get reminders, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And to get all reminders, you need to ding the bell. So don't forget to do that as well. Anyway, my name is Brendan, your structural engineer based in Australia. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.